Thank you so much for coming, and also thank you to those on Zoom for tuning in. I am delighted this evening to introduce Jennifer Roberts, the Elizabeth Carey Agassi Professor of the Humanities at Harvard University, where she has been on the faculty of the Art and Architecture Department for over two decades. I'm going to tell you what I most admire about Jennifer as an art historian and speak briefly to her many scholarly contributions. First, however, I want to warmly welcome her back to Yale, where she received her PhD in 2000, and to explain the occasion for her lecture. Jennifer is here as part of a workshop sponsored by the Getty Foundation's Paper Project, spearheaded by my fantastic colleague, Freda Spira, at the Yale University Art Gallery, and made possible through the tremendous support of the staff of this museum. Over the past several days, the workshop has brought together colleagues in academia, libraries, museums, and publishing, who are all invested in the study and exhibition of early modern drawings and prints, namely those made before year 1900. In a series of conversations, we have aimed to confront, reassess, and reimagine the future of this field. Conversation in person and in front of works on paper themselves still feels like a luxury in the wake of the recent years, and it is essential for generating new ideas and directions for research. For those who are not part of the workshop, Jennifer's lecture and the lecture of our other wonderful keynote speaker, Peter Parshall, who spoke this past Wednesday, are meant to invite a broader audience to join this conversation. And I should add that both lectures will shortly be available via the gallery's YouTube channel, so do tell your friends. Like Peter, Jennifer is a scholar whose work I have turned to time and again for her investment in the stuff of works of art and always asking how a thing was made alongside why it was made, and in looking closely as a starting point for thinking big. Many of you may know Jennifer from her 2021 Mellon Lectures at the National Gallery of Art, where she, which she delivered with aplomb over Zoom during the dark days of the pandemic. Those lectures, titled Contact, Art, and the Pool of Print, will be published as a book this coming February by Princeton University Press, and it is sure to be a beautiful and inspiring volume. Her previous monographs include Mere Travels, Robert Smithson and History, published in 2004, and Transporting Visions, the Movement of Images in Early America, the latter published in 2014, and a book that in my view revealed Jennifer to be as much an early modernist as a scholar of the modern and contemporary. And if you have not read her chapter on Audubon's The Birds of America, I really cannot recommend it enough. It made me think differently about scale, about natural history, and about the history of the book as a physical object. In addition, Jennifer has traversed the often falsely reified divides between the world of universities and museums, scholars and makers. She curated an exhibition on Jasper Johns and Press at the Harvard Art Museums in 2012, and is currently co-authoring a book with the artist Dario Robleto on the graphic, medical, and emotional technology of the pulse wave. In the same vein, Jennifer has pushed the intersection of art and science in ways that go beyond simply blowing steam to play on the acronym that has increasingly replaced STEM in calls to move beyond that traditional binary. She has a forthcoming book on Harvard's astronomical glass plate photograph collection and is herself a photographer of icicles, moss, and dew, which she shares through her delightful Instagram account that I recommend to all of you. But I want to close this brief introduction by saying that Jennifer is also a rare scholar whose teaching is no less exemplary than her writing. The opportunity that I had to serve as her teaching assistant during my years in graduate school was the closest thing that I ever got to a seminar in pedagogy. She models teaching as a practice of not just imparting expertise, but of imparting the skills of communication that all of us need, no matter our profession. None of us can or should exist in a closed circuit. So it is especially fitting that she is speaking to us today on the circuitous history of print. Please join me in welcoming Jennifer Roberts. It's such a pleasure to be back here in this auditorium, which I don't think I've been in since the 90s. Uh, I remember watching Mel Bachner speak here. Um, thanks to everyone for being here at 5.30 on a Friday afternoon, which is quite something in itself. 
Um, and thanks to Freda Spira as well and the Getty Paper Project for inviting me to be part of this workshop. So for those of you, again, that are tuning in on Zoom, this, is, um, this, lec this, this lecture is part of a week-long workshop called New Approaches to the Field of Early Modern Works on Paper. Um, from my mostly modernist corner of the world, I've often gazed longingly at the early modern print field, and it's been such an honor to be able to lurk in the background of the conversations this week, uh, listening to talks about Durer and Piranesi and Calo, et cetera, and to meet so many scholars uh, that I've admired from afar for so many years. Now, an early modern print conference might seem like a rather strange setting for a lecture about circuit printing. But again, the goal of this workshop is to think about how to make early modern drawings and prints, quote, accessible, provocative, and relevant to larger multidisciplinary conversations in the 21st century, end quote. And so that's what I'm going to try to do this evening. I'm going to try to establish a circuit between today's digital information technology and the much longer history of printmaking in order to propose that all of this old, precious, beautifully printed paper that we love so much is not only relevant but fundamental to an understanding of the way we live in the 21st century. Now, in the spirit of this workshop, I should say that this lecture is highly speculative and preliminary. I do not have a fully worked out grand theory of the printed circuit. Uh, I'm still just really trying to peer into the fog and perceive some possible outlines of a way of thinking that doesn't really exist yet in the print studies field, or at least that doesn't have any prestige or traction. The printed circuit has, as far as I can tell, virtually no presence in the art historical literature or even the humanities literature. And that's not surprising because putting it there would involve difficult and uncomfortable leaps across disciplines that are radically segregated in contemporary structures of knowledge. So I can only begin tonight to, be, uh, to suggest some possible approaches and affinities. I should also say this is a piece of research that I began thinking about uh, maybe six or seven years ago, but it was marooned by the pressure of other projects and the exigencies of the pandemic. It didn't quite fit into my Mellon lectures, uh, and I had begun to despair of ever returning to it when I got an email from Freda and Marissa inviting me here, and Freda assured me that my talk could be strange. In fact, as she said, the stranger the better. Uh, so I jumped at this opportunity to unearth some of these thoughts uh, and share them with you. Before beginning, I just want to acknowledge two of my former students, Christine Garnier and Christopher Williams Wynn, in conversation with whom uh, I began to develop some of these ideas many years ago. Okay. There are rumors abroad that we are currently witnessing the death of print. As the story goes, the digital revolution is sending print to its extinction. The old ways of printing, woodcut, etching, engraving, lithography, screen printing, are all being unceremoniously replaced by digital image transfer between computer screens. Information is now being viewed and communicated electronically, ephemerally, without ever going through a printing press or getting anywhere near a sheet of paper. As we all know from our daily interactions with our devices, texts and images today are more likely to be found traveling as electrical signals through the metallic pathways of a circuit board than they are to be engraved or etched or drawn on a matrix to be printed on paper in a press. Print, they say, is dying. And we're all familiar with this tale of declension, this tale of woe. And I think it's probably fair to say that everyone in this room is interested in contesting or complicating this tale one way or another. And there are many ways that this can be done. Uh, we can show that print and digital images should not be seen as successive, but rather parallel technologies that continue to evolve in tandem. We can argue that whatever happens to traditional ink on paper print, it will continue to live on as a kind of phantom structure, shaping the way we organize our thinking about new media. But this evening, I want to try a different tack. I want to explore what seems to me to be the profound implications of a very simple, even blatantly literal fact that is staring right at us from the screen behind me. And that is that this circuit board on the screen, this circuit board that is supposedly killing off print, is itself a print. The circuits that run our lives, that sit in our smartphones and laptops and cars, the circuits that run the projector on the ceiling that's bringing this luminous image before your eyes, these circuits are known in electrical engineering as PCBs or printed circuit boards. So these are printed. What do we make of this? Given that this is unquestionably a print, how do we incorporate it into the history of print that we're used to telling? Do we acknowledge it as internal to the story of printmaking, as part of its continually unfolding history, 
or do we see it as Prince Apocalypse? As print scholars, do we take this object seriously? Do we welcome it into our print rooms and our research? Is it worthy of our attention? If not, why not? What do we gain or preserve by holding it away from printmaking proper? If it is worthy of our attention, which obviously I think it might be or I wouldn't be standing here, how should we shape that attention? What are the stakes and the goals of puzzling through the apparent contradiction that it presents to us? So this lecture is an attempt first to do the work involved in recognizing this object as a print, whose history is in fact coterminous with that of early modern printmaking. And second, it's an attempt to map out some of the opportunities that that recognition might offer us as print historians, as historians in general, and most broadly as advocates for the arts and humanities in a world that seems, but I think only seems, to be expanding beyond our purview. This is Paul Eisler. You will not find him in any books about printmaking. If you ask a print historian to rattle off a list of the great modern printmakers and printers and print enablers of the 20th century, Picasso, Cassatt, Johns, Tatiana Grossman, June Wayne, Eisler's name is not going to come up. But one could make the argument that he did more than anyone else in the 20th century to expand the range of print. Eisler was born in 1907 and raised in Vienna. He was trained as an engineer at the Technical University in Vienna, but he couldn't get a job upon graduation because he was Jewish and positions in electrical engineering were reserved for German nationalists. So he got a different job as a technical editor that required him to collaborate closely with printers and to study print technology. But his employers at that job were social socialists and the Nazis shut them down. Recognizing the existential Nazi threat, Eisler left Vienna for London in 1936. He knew no one in Great Britain and had to figure out how to get into the country and get a visa. He ended up setting meetings with various technical companies about potentially investing in some of his many inventions. One of his ideas, still quite embryonic at that point, was the printed circuit. It was an idea that had emerged from his unusual Nazi-constrained career path, which had included both electrical engineering and printing. Electrical circuits at the time were <laughs> bulky and extremely labor-intensive to produce. And on the left is the uh, inside of the chassis of a 1948 television. Um, and on the right, upper right is a radio from the 30s. These were assembled by hand using what's called point-to-point -point wiring with wires hand-soldered to various components. And of course, note that this is just total chaos visually and it seems seemingly in every other respect. Eisler's idea was essentially to print these wires. Instead of connecting wires to components one by one, he proposed that printing technology should be used to create electrical pathways using conductive metals on a flat surface. Components could then be attached to that. This is a radio factory showing an assembly line for wiring up uh, radios in the 30s. These factories depended on cheap, i.e. women's labor at the time. Each factory and each category of electronic component had its own specialized method of assembly. Eisler felt that circuits could be and should be lighter, more durable, shockproof, standardized, flexible, capable of miniaturization and capable of accurate automated reproduction. And one of his main arguments was that these improvements would not require the development of an entirely new industry, but could take advantage of an already existing, extremely sophisticated method of producing two-dimensional copied objects, namely printing. As he put it, printing, quote, was a recognized method of automatically reproducing great numbers of exact copies of a two-dimensional original, sounding like he read William Ivins there. This is his first radio prototype using a printed circuit board. It still looks um, bulky and primitive today because of the big components, but you can see how the tangle of wires have been replaced by printed conductors on a board to which the components are attached. So these are the printed wires now. These are the components, like some vacuum tube stuff, but this is the innovation, is the printing out of these wires on a flat surface. This is the progenitor of the printed circuit boards that run the vast majority of all of our electronic equipment today. Now the relationship between these printed circuit boards and traditional printmaking um, might seem merely coincidental or casual here, 
But actually, Eisler's innovation emerged directly from a careful study of the long history of printmaking. In fact, his ideas came from time that he spent in the British Museum studying the history of printmaking. As he put it in his memoir, although I already had experience of printing from my days as a technical editor in Vienna, I learned far more after reaching Britain by installing myself in the library of the British Museum. I became fascinated by the impressive technological achievements of the printing art. I saw this art as a whole, letterpress and gravure, lithography, offset and screen printing, engraving and photomechanical printing. As I read, I imbibed all the main processes like the wisdom of ultimate redemption. This is how we all feel this week, right? Um, so circuit printing emerged from the center of traditional fine art and commercial printing techniques. Eisler is responding to old school printmaking, the kind of printmaking we all work on, as this wisdom of ultimate redemption. Now, I don't want to overwhelm you with process information, but I'll give you just a basic idea of the most common process that Eisler devised and promoted. It's basically a unique combination of screen printing and etching. Um, so he's, you start with a, with a non-conductive insulating base that has a copper foil laminated to both sides. Uh, then a circuit pattern is screen printed onto that surface with acid resistant ink. So the screen printing ink is just to sort of resist. Then the whole board is etched, which removes everything from around the wires because they're protected by the resist. And then, uh, and then the plate is cleaned, leaving this printed wire standing uh, in copper. So as you can see, these are pretty much standard printmaking techniques that he's putting to use uh, in this um, procedure. And he experimented with many different methods and many other combinations of techniques, including certain photographic steps. But this is the essential and most commonly uh, used procedure that he developed. So the circuit design, the design that would be screen printed onto the circuit and then etched, uh, became a form of art and a form of printmaking in itself. Uh, this involved the preparation of a screen matrix done by hand usually prior to CAD systems. Uh, and these were made at much larger than actual size than reduced photographically made into silk screens and etched. So you can see, uh, you know, if you dig around on the internet, you can find these great old photos of uh, drafts people designing, designing the circuit layouts. And there was a real art to laying out a circuit board. In fact, this is called the artwork. So if you're, if you're getting a circuit board made, this is the artwork. Um, the traces have to be properly spaced to avoid signal interference. You have to manage the thickness of the traces very carefully. You have to think about the angle of the turns. The length of the different tracks will differentially affect the speed of processing and need to be coordinated across the board. The operation of the circuit generates heat, so you have to distribute that heat evenly to avoid setting everything on fire, etc. cetera. Um, so it's really a complicated process and one that I hope to learn more about uh, eventually. We're living in the world made by the spectacular success of this fusion of electronics and printmaking, but it was not automatic. It actually took years for Eisler to find anyone who was willing to invest in his idea. He traveled throughout the UK giving presentation after presentation with no takers. He couldn't get anyone to buy into his ideas at first about the power of printing. Entrenched systems of labor and production prevented him at first from getting much traction. For example, he took his idea to a radio manufacturing company in Ilford, which had a production line similar to this one, and they were intrigued by the, by the idea, but they had no immediate motivation to automate their production. And as one official at the company said, quote, girls are cheaper and more flexible, end quote. So needless to say, there's a whole history of labor and gender and craft and automation to be, to be pursued here as well. The recalcitrance of the industry at first meant that Eisler was motivated to continue to develop and perfect the process as well as to hone his rhetoric about the value of printing to a very high polish. He had to be able to articulate in a clear and per persuasive language the rationale for turning to printing technology for the electronics industry. He wrote two books about circuit printing that capture some of that language. These are my primary sources for this talk, uh, the Technology of Printed Circuits, first Printed, first published in 1959, and My Life with the Printed Circuit, which is his memoir um, published three years before his death in uh, 1989. Um, and these are my primary sources for this talk. These books are a boon for print historians because they're such 
clear, almost painfully self-conscious accounts of this moment in the history of print. They detail all of his technical experiments and clearly state the exact social and cultural motivations for turning to print at this moment, or at least uh, what he wanted to say about those cultural motivations. If anyone wants to pick up on this in their teaching, I'd recommend assigning the early chapters of um, My Life with a Printed Circuit. It's a really clear uh, description of how these things worked. Um, of course, these are not digitized. This is all used bookstore material, and you have to look in specialized technical libraries for it. But um, that's as much of this kind of history is still just at the technical level. It hasn't really bubbled up into university libraries. So from his writings, three main themes and arguments for turning to print and printmaking come through. First, print can be mobilized. Second, print is surface oriented. And third, print is a universally adaptable technology. His first argument was that print could be quickly mobilized, and I use the term mobilized in the military sense, put to work for the war effort. One of his main motivations for pursuing the print printed circuit board in the UK was to do whatever he could to de help defeat the Nazis, and one of his main arguments was that the printed circuit would directly help the war effort. But it was hard to get people to think about printing as a defense technology. He had to overcome an entrenched view of print as a passively illustrational or merely visual or propagandistic technology. Uh, and as he put it, during the war, printing was not considered by the government to be an essential industry in the same sense as engineering, which could be readily converted to direct war production. Printing was necessary for maintaining morale, for help in administration, and so on, but it did not directly produce arms and munitions. In the very rough grouping of goods into guns and butter, its products decidedly belonged to the latter category. The printing industry was, therefore, not mobilized for the war effort in any but a very indirect way, and its output for civilian use was severely restricted. So he's essentially arguing here for the weaponization of print, putting print in the guns column, refusing the argument that print is merely illustrational or visual. Print can be used to make propaganda posters, yes, but it can also be used to make armaments. Uh, and later in his life, he would really retreat from any kind of work on military projects. So I don't want to paint him as a kind of warmonger technician, and I'll return to this question later. But I think the fundamental question here, the fundamental point in his thinking, is basically that print can do things. It can take on a kind of strong, direct, physical agency in the world. The printed circuit for Eisler is a special kind of operational image that can generate physical causality, not simply conceptual or pictorial results. Mobilization is, in fact, exactly what happened, and it's what ultimately led to the adoption of the printed circuit. Uh, in the course of dozens of presentations that he gave to allied military groups, the Americans picked up on the printed circuit idea and secretly developed a program to use printed circuits for proximity fuses in their anti-aircraft operations. A proximity fuse is basically a, a miniature radio emitter and receiver that can be fitted into an anti-aircraft shell or to any other kind of missile. Um, it basically emits a radio signal that when it bounces off of a metallic object nearby, like in this case a German warplane over London or uh, a bomb, um, it will trigger a, de a detonation. And the trigger mechanism in, this, um, in, in these fuses used a printed circuit board. By the end of the war, printed circuit boards were being used successfully in American shells against rockets launched toward Britain, quickly became the standard. By 1948, the US had mandated printed circuits in all airborne instruments because they were small, light, and accurate. His second big argument um, had to do with surface dimensionality of printing. Along with the notion of print as something to be literally mobilized, Eisler also emphasized the momentous shift in the spatial models of electronic engineering that the printed circuit would enable. He discussed the translation from what he called body elements to what he called surface elements. This would entail the redesign of three-dimensional structures of conventional electrical equipment, this mass of wires interconnecting distinct components, uh, into a clean, flat, two-dimensional pattern. So one of the examples uh, of such a clean, flat, two-dimensional pattern that he includes in his own book is this printed circuit for a telephone exchange. There's a clear aesthetic here of spacing and untangling. The wires in becoming printed settle upon a two-dimensional plane, and this requires that they be carefully designed to occupy that plane without crossing. And so an entire two-dimensional geometry 
begins to be developed here to maximize the surface area of the circuit while maintaining the necessary spaces between the wires. Um, I think this is beginning to work through some of the same problems of occupying a surface with line that you see in the history of ornament. And we'll talk a little bit more about ornament uh, in a little bit. While these patterns were being developed, this would have had a very strong aesthetic of clarity, self-evidence, and a, again, a certain ornamental beauty. Nothing's hidden, nothing's awkward. Everything is laid out for the eye to see as on a map. My first reaction to Eisler's theorization of dimensional space was to compare it to what was about to happen in advanced painting in the United States, where the picture plane uh, would become a circuit-like space very soon. Between the 40s and the 60s, there was an enormous upheaval in the privileged understanding of the picture plane in painting. First, you had the Jackson Pollock model, or uh, the analog to the point-to-point -point wiring model in which one has the sense of gazing into a bramble or vortex of tangled lines, a gateway, gateway into some mysterious psyche or some other world. But that's being replaced by the 60s by a picture plane that emphasizes a kind of radical superficiality or surface orientation. Uh, Frank Stella's stripe paintings are a great example of this. Not only does uh, this painting look a little bit like a circuit, it actually is acting like a circuit for the eye. It's painted in, of all things, copper paint, which Stella said he chose because it would repel the eye from trying to fall into the depths. He said that his stripes, quote, force illusionistic space out of the painting at a constant rate by using a regulated pattern, end quote. It's really tempting to go to painting as the most appealing analog for Eisler's work with the circuit. And no doubt his printed circuits did have an effect on the surface aesthetics of the 60s in the world of painting, and that's a whole other project. But Eisler is actually not thinking about painting when he's thinking about the surface of a circuit. He's thinking about printing. He's not thinking about this flatness in terms of canvas, he's thinking about it in terms of paper. Eisler compared the printed circuit to the clarity, planarity, and rationality of letterpress and book printing. Most printed circuit boards are actually made of multiple layers of circuits that are stacked up one on top of each other. And when he's talking about layered circuits, especially those with patterns printed on both sides, he makes a direct analogy to book printing. In circuits comprising two plane patterns, these patterns can be superimposed on the front and back of the same insulating base, like ordinary print on the front and back page of a book. In circuits comprising more than these patterns, they form a thin pile of superimposed and interconnected multi-layers, also like pages in a book. Prize for anyone who recognizes this book spine from the Yale Art Gallery recent catalogs. In describing a stack of circuits as a book, Eisler was turning to models of spatial organization that had long been operative in the history of print in order to map out a new surface dimensionality for electronic pathways. In the world of circuits, three-dimensional space would no longer be composed of tangled wires looping around in a sculptural fashion. Instead, three-dimensionality would be something made from the topological manipulation of surfaces, stacked, warped, folded. Again, this is a kind of space that print had already developed, and with the complex folds and signatures of bookmaking. This is a design for um, a printed electromagnetic coil that Eisler came up with uh, that has been designed to be printed flat and then folded once and then to assume its coil-like shape through concertina folding. Of course, concertina is a standard fold for brochures and letter printing. It takes a lot of training for printers and designers and bookmakers to be able to lay out material in such a way that it comes together properly when folded in these various configurations. And Eisler is, is clearly thinking in the same way, thinking of his own training as a printer when he is designing coils in this way. This is another example of uh, a coil that he designed. Printing also allowed the wiring patterns to be deposited on other flexible supports so that circuits could occupy space by warping, bending, or curling, usually in order to conform with the dimensions of an appliance or some other object. This is flexible heating film developed by Eisler where the heating conductors are printed on and then this would be applied to surfaces such as airplane wings for de-icing. He even imagined these new printed surfaces inhabiting the body. This is a design for a prosthetic arm that benefits from the ability of the circuit to follow the curve of the body. Surfaces of print folding, stacking, and wrapping themselves into and around the dimensional world. Spaces made up of the manipulation of flat surfaces. 
And then the third basic principle that he identified for circuit printing that I want to mention quickly is, what he, is just what he called the universality need of the printer. And what he meant by this was the fact that printing technologies are highly adaptable and transferable. An engraver can use the same tools, methods, and personnel team to generate an infinite possible number of images. The same basic technology can make a landscape, a portrait, or a business form. Printing is a kind of universal technical language that can serve highly specialized outcomes. And of course it has to because no printmaker could afford to set up shop if they had to retool for every different kind of subject matter that they might want to print. And it was this universal adaptability that Eisler wanted to move over into electronics along with the print process itself. At the time, there was no standardized method of creating circuits. Each manufacturing process for, say, televisions, radios, radar, generated its own particular models and its own tangles of wires. The printed circuit was a standardized manufacturing method that could generate boards for virtually all electronic applications. The printed circuit board is one of the main reasons that we can now talk about the electronics industry. The same printing technology that can be used to drive a clock radio on your bedside table can be used to drive the magnetometer for a robotic probe that's going to go to Jupiter. And all of this comes from the lesson of printing and printmaking. All right. So the circuits that run the digital world come from the print world. The turn to the computer age, after World War II, the turn to the world of ambient digital technology that we now live in was also a turn to print. To my mind, this is both an enrichment and a challenge to the ways we normally think about print, because it means that we have to be able to think about this alien object, a circuit board, as something that can sit in the world of art prints where we work. We need to be able to rethink the history of print in such a way that it would prepare the way for this object, include this artifact as part of its purview. So for the rest of the talk, I want to offer a few thoughts for how we might begin to assemble such a history from the materials already at hand. Now, it might seem that in order to develop an account of the relationship between printing and digital circuitry, art historians would need to turn to late modern and contemporary art and explore the work of artists who process this relationship directly in their work. So look at artists who live in the age of the printed circuit board. And of course, this is a very good idea, um, especially in regards to modern and contemporary printmakers. If I were going to do this, I would want to study the work of someone like Eduardo Paolozzi, uh, whose exquisite screen prints made with Chris Prater at Kelpra Studios in London in the 1960s ponder exactly this relationship between circuit screen printing and art screen printing, including the way the specter of the defense industry haunts the world of culture at every level. Um, Paolozzi, if anyone's looking for a dissertation topic, please do that. <laughs> really interesting printmaker who is um, clearly thinking about screen printing as something that is sitting in both of these worlds. Of course, we could dive into the digital art field and all of the things that are happening in, in contemporary art now, and that would be, of course, very fruitful. But for today, I want to emphasize that we don't necessarily need to become contemporary art specialists in order to build these connections. The longer history of print is a crucial part of the digital world, and historical scholarship is essential to its articulation. Let's meditate for a moment on just what kind of print this is. This is a very, very simple printed circuit. It's the kind of thing that uh, electrical engineering students sort of do in their fab labs in their freshman year. Um, what is this doing? How can we talk about this kind of line? Um, one of the first things we might say is that this is a kind of printed line that is conductive, right? It's conceived as a channel or a passage that shapes and enables movement and action. Second, we might think a little bit about its temporality. It's both immediate and sequential. It's a visible pattern, an image, like a printed image that we might see any day, that would be something we would see immediately. But it's also meant to be read or seen in a sequential way. In other words, electrons have to flow through it in a specific order, in a specific sequence. In this sense, it's a kind of hybrid between the printed picture and the printed book and that is something you can both look at, and it's also something that is to be read. Third, uh, this is a kind of print that engages the participation of non-human forces. These are lines that are designed to be quote unquote read by electrons. Their formal qualities uh, appeal to this natural force so that it can be properly channeled. 
these lines shape natural forces into specific effects in the world. So essentially when we're looking at a printed circuit board, we are looking at a kind of intersection between human looking and natural forces looking at this print, right? This is, a circuit board is a meeting point between humans and electricity. Fourth, I would just point out that a printed circuit is what we might call an executable print. Once it's printed in the usual manner, it's able to execute other instructions and essentially play or activate other phenomena. An executable print is a print that's capable of continual regeneration and reanimation. It sparks an ongoing chain of agency in which prints can themselves become something like matrices out in the world, generating new actions or impressions and conducting further activity through and beyond themselves. This is, of course, a very old idea in the history of print, the power of print to propagate endless chains of causality. It stretches back to medieval theories of the commutative image and to enlightenment models of knowledge as a series of transfers of impressions in and between minds. In the study rooms and special collections around campus this week, the scholars in this workshop have repeatedly engaged with centuries old works on paper that could easily, easily be reimagined as circuit-like images in this sense. We've looked at printed scientific instruments and calculating devices that I'll say more about in a moment. We've looked at things like devotional prints that are designed to regenerate the presence of the depicted saint or divine for the believer. A devotional print can certainly be described as conductive and moreover as conductive for non-human or divine agents, also a kind of meeting plane between the human and the non-human. We've described the power of prints using terms like efficacy and performativity and activation. We've already been working in something like the realm of conductive and executable prints. To build the long history of the printed circuit, on the most basic level, we might wanna start by remembering that printmaking shares a great deal with the fundamental operations of computing. For example, printmaking can be seen as a kind of programming in as much as it's a mode of encoding instructions to be read and executed by a machine. Rembrandt's 17th century etching plate is a matrix that gives instructions to the printing press in how to create multiple copies of his self-portrait. The task of making Rembrandt's, Rembrandt's printed portrait is delegated to a machine using an instructional matrix. A printed circuit, of course, does not work exactly the same way, but the principle of delegation is operative in both cases. Both the printing matrix and the circuit board are operational images, inasmuch as they guide and enable the carrying out of tasks by non-human agents. Moreover, printmaking is a process of binary coding. The matrix is programmed by dividing its surface into printing and non-printing areas. A process like etching involves composing active and inactive parts of the matrix. And printmaking in the West has, since the 15th century, been deeply engaged in exploring the behavior of metals. In etching, the printmaker uses a needle and acid to generate channels in copper for the flow of ink. In circuit printing, the engineer uses etching to build copper pathways for the flow of electrons. The basic elements involve using metallurgical expertise to divide a surface into two categories, active and passive, inked or uninked, conductive and non-conductive. And I'd also mention that from around the 19th century, printmaking has also been a sphere for the direct harnessing of electrical currents in its perfection of various models of electroplating. So printmaking is generally aligned with the fundamental binary operations of computing. But I also think there is a kind of fundamental special affinity between early printmaking in Europe in particular, and the kind of thinking that went into the advent of the printed circuit. I'm hoping that in, during the first half of this talk, um, the early modernists in the audience were experiencing maybe small flashes of recognition as I was speaking about Eisler's work. Um, I certainly am seeing a lot of similarities between these two realms of printing. To start with, we might think about the mobilization or weaponization of print that the printed circuit board brought about. This seems much less surprising when we consider that printing technology has been intimately linked to military technology before. In fact, there are very deep originary connections between printmaking and armament, especially in the process of etching. Etching as a printmaking technique is thought to have been devised by the arms etcher Daniel Hopfer in 15th century Augsburg, a major center for the production of weapons and armor in Europe at the time. 
Hopefer developed an acid etching technique for decorating armor and weapons and then adapted it to flat plates and added ink and printed it. And this was first done as a way of recording and publicizing his designs for armor. And then he apparently showed the technique to Durer and there you go. So we see in the early modern period in these yeasty beginnings of, of European printmaking that there was already a link between metals, print, and weaponry in the rise of etching, which would then be used for uh, proximity fuse circuits in the 20th century. All of which is to say that the mobilization of printing as a military technology that Eisler had so strenuously advocated in the 30s and 40s was not an entirely new idea. It was part of printing's origins in the first place. In the case of this breastplate, you etch lines into a metal object that protects the body from other metal objects. In the case of the printed trigger circuit in the proximity fuse, you etch a circuit of lines in metal to make a metal object that will shield bodies from flying metal objects. That was a mouthful. Um, etching began as a printification of weaponry, so it's not so strange to imagine it enabling 400 years later the weaponization of printing. It's also not new to envision a print that goes on to have a direct instrumental function in the world. And in this sense, we can also think of all the early modern printed scientific instruments that Suzanne Karschmitz and others in this room have done so much to bring to light in the field. Here is the Emperor's Astronomy, published in 1540 in Ingolstadt, and I just grabbed this snapshot from upstairs in the Crafting Worldviews exhibition yesterday. Here we have rotating paper wheels that allow for astronomical and astrological calculations. These are prints that work as calculation devices. These are the printed computers of the 15th and 16th centuries. Or think of the printed sundials by the great Georg Hartmann, these come flat out of the press, but are meant to be cut and folded into working sundials. Like Eisler's concertina electromagnetic coil, Hartmann's sundials are prints that break out of the virtual illusionistic symbolic world that is thought to be the default territory of the image. These are prints that enter the world as agents of literal physical causality when they're folded into a three-dimensional configuration taking advantage of the topological flexibility of paper, which can exist both in the two-dimensional flat conceptual world, as well as then take its place in the three-dimensional material world. I really wish I had more time to think and talk with you about Durer's knots, which are so much about flow and ductility and which, uh, as Susan Dackerman has recently explored, are made in imitation of Islamic wire work. Uh, in other words, these are printed wires of a sort uh, and very much about thinking about um, the occupation of a surface by a linear ductile material. Um, but more generally, uh, I think a really important way to think about the relationship between circuit printing and early modern print is to go into the whole question of ornament and ornament generally. Um, on the left is a page from a book of ornaments by Etienne Joseph Daudet from 1689. It's part of a, one of a couple of fantastic new ornament books that we have in the Harvard Art Museums. Um, so I wanna just think a little bit here about so-called ornament prints or books of ornamental designs that were common, um, especially in the 17th century and really pick up on something that Shira Briesman mentioned yesterday, namely that these early modern printed ornaments shouldn't just be imagined as a kind of passive decoration uh, in the world, rather they're a kind of projective ornament um, in the conditional tense, as she said, I thought that was a great phrase. Something, these, these are images that are understood to be made into something later. They're to go out into the world and be executed in being added to three-dimensional objects. Likewise, a circuit board is a printed pattern that is to be activated later in the space of the world. As a simple visual print, it too is conditional. Flip the switch and it becomes active. We might also think about Alfred Gell's famous argument about the efficacy of ornament as a kind of trap for the eye or for the soul. Ornament has the power to conduct you, condition your movements, just as a circuit literally conducts and conditions an electric current. Our circuit board history of print would also need to acknowledge that printing has long been used to make things other than images to put in rare book libraries or museum print study rooms and has always been adjacent to other kinds of manufacturing. 
Eisler had struggled to convince people of this, to convince people of printing's immense range and its imbrication in many spheres of activity. We tend to subscribe to ideas about printmaking as something that's securely and safely enclosed in the aesthetic or informational sphere. Print is stuck in the butter from the guns and butter scenario. But in insisting that print could do things and make things other than prints, Eisler was actually rediscovering the ancient affinities between printing and other kinds of making and manufacturing. Printing techniques have always been inspired by and derived from other procedures for manufacturing multiples, embossing, stamping, punching, branding, stenciling. Printing reflects and reflects upon other surrounding reproduction technologies. So in other words, the boundaries between printing and other kinds of replication methods that don't make images per se um, are very, very porous. For example, printing is one of the various resources of mechanical art that Charles Babbage famously cataloged in his 1832 text on the economy of machinery and manufacturers. This is a very interesting book for many reasons. One of them is that Charles Babbage is the Charles Babbage, the Cambridge mathematician who is credited with having come up with the concept of the programmable computer through his different difference engine and analytic engine. Printmaking was very much part of his thinking and it was very much integrated with his thinking about all other kinds of copying and making and manufacturing things. He has a whole chapter on copying, uh, which is a great read. I actually assign this to my students. Um, the section on copying begins with intaglio printing or printing from cavities, as he puts it, uh, and then goes on to woodblock printing, printing from surfaces, and proceeds through an analysis of things like ornamental brick making, embossed china, molded umbrella handles, punched iron plates for boilers, and even lace made by caterpillars. In this book, the kinds of prints that we all work on in museums and art history classrooms, copper plate engraving, woodcut, etc., rub shoulders with boilerplate, boilerplate punching and other industrial production techniques that we would not normally see as part of our purview. But Babbage saw these affinities. He saw printmaking as it sat in that much broader territory of making things and making things that make other things. I want to stop for a minute and linger um, on this lace made by caterpillars section, which uh, the more I've been thinking about it, the more fascinated I am by it. Um, it's very strange and unexpected. Um, he points out that, that uh, it's a species of manufacture which is in a slight degree connected with copying, but he clearly is so interested in it that he's going to write a whole paragraph about it. Um, he's reporting on something that has been contrived by an officer of engineers residing at Munich. Um, and basically, he's talking about this process where there's a, you make a paste of leaves and you spread it evenly and thinly over a stone. Then with a camel hair pencil dipped in olive oil, you draw the pattern you wish for the insects to leave open. The stone is then placed in an inclined position and a considerable number of the caterpillars are placed at the bottom. A peculiar species is chosen which spins a strong web and the animals commence at the bottom eating and spinning their way up to the top carefully avoiding every part touched by the oil, but devouring every other part of the paste. And so basically these caterpillars are crawling up through this matrix pattern. Uh, and when they get to the top, you have this piece of lace. And he talks about this as um, a caterpillar veil. And he la later puts in tables uh, comparing these caterpillar veils to other kinds of textiles and calicos and so forth. Um, one of the things that's interesting to me is that it seems to me that this is actually a very early moment in the imaginary of the printed circuit. Babbage is imagining a surface pattern that conducts a natural entity, guides it on a certain path over a surface. If you replace the leaf paste with copper and the caterpillars with electrons, you basically have yourself a printed circuit. And I also wanted to put this up here just as a side note because it points to something that I won't have time to delve into further this evening, and namely that's a discussion of textiles and the importance of textiles in this whole question of circuits and computing. It's now generally understood that the advent of computing owes a great deal to textile production. We've all heard of the Jacquard loom and its programmable punch cards, um, but, but uh, computing's debt to printing is much less frequently discussed. And one way of getting these three uh, these three areas together, printing, textiles, and computing, is thinking about um, all of the different ways that in Babbage and other early thinkers around programming, um, you see both printing and uh, textiles coming together in their thinking. 
The general point, though, in bringing in Babbage here is that both Babbage and Eisler see printmaking in a much wider angle than we do as art historians. Print history for them includes many kinds of printing that don't show up in museums and print rooms. Printing that sits at the margins of what we recognize as printmaking. Many of these seemingly marginal non-art print techniques are the closest cognates and analogs for circuit printing, especially in as much as they're prints that do things. If we nudge some of these other kinds of prints into the center of our purview, we might better equip ourselves and our students to think through the continuities between fine art printing and circuit printing. So I just want to give two examples of things that are prints that work in the world and function in, its, in, in a circuit-like way, but that don't generally sit at the center of our concerns um, in early print studies. One is printed currency. Um, this is one of my very favorite topics. This is how I got into print history, was thinking about printed currency. Uh, this is an ex excellent example because printed currency is a place where printing technology is used to create an object that literally produces an economy, enables transaction, provides security and authenticity, and it is the kind of object that would not be possible without printing because its value depends upon the exactitude of its reproduction and its wide dissimilability. Um, and I've written at length about um, currency, printed currency as uh, a challenge in producing an irreproducible reproductive object. Every, every piece of currency has to look exactly like every other piece of currency, so you know you've got the real money, but it also has to be something that can't be replicated and can't be faked. And so all of these devices that you see on a piece of printed currency are anti-counterfeiting devices um, that have to be created using the medium of print. So all these ornamental designs, um, and certain other aspects of the printing are ways of using print to become in, unreplicable beyond their first initial printing. And this, um, this is a kind of print that literally produces exchange um, between partners in, a, in, uh, in an economic environment. Another way that a print, by virtue of being printed, in the way it's printed, makes something happen in the world. There's also the entire realm of printing as it intersects with music. This is something that uh, I'm extremely interested in and beginning to think more about. Um, think about a vinyl record. We don't normally think about that as a print. It's not something that we put in our print exhibitions, but it is very much a print. Waveform impressions of sounds are engraved on copper and then replicated through impression into a polycarbonate support instead of a paper support. Um, you know, a, a, an LP record is actually a beautiful thing. It's an image in itself. And in fact, in the early years of gramophone recording, people used to ink records and print them as a form of advertisement for record companies. And in fact, if you look back at early, like early 20th century gramophone advertisements, those prints are often the only record we have of sound recordings that have themselves been lost. So there's this fascinating connection between uh, sound recording and print. Um, but basically the point of uh, bringing in a record here is that a record is a printed image that then also executes other functions, right? It's a print, but then the needle of the record player follows these impressed channels. The record is awakened or turned on and music flows through and out of the printed matrix just as a circuit sits in a state of latency until the processor begins running and electricity flows through its channels. And in this category of printed music that does things, you would also want to think about something like um, perforated piano rolls for um, player pianos and other kinds of like, music box, perforated paper objects that are printed. Perforation is also a kind of printing. So in the largest sense, of course, this is not just all about circuit printing. Um, in the contemporary context, we also have 3D printing, bioprinting, food printing, and new and powerful versions of printed materials. Everything today is being quote unquote printed. Printing is becoming synonymous with manufacturing itself. At pr as print scholars, it seems that we should be reaching out to this world, exploring it, mapping its affinities and divergences with the kind of printing that we teach and display. Now, I've just barely scratched the surface of some of these contemporary high-tech 
print and print adjacent manufacturing techniques. But I have found actually that even just a casual curiosity about a particular process quickly leads to really startling connections between the work of historic printmakers and the most advanced technical developments in the sciences and engineering that we would normally think we have nothing to say about. So even just beginning to dig into some of these crazy new techniques, um, I think that as print scholars, we actually will recognize things um, in these techniques that um, are essentially affinities. And just to give one example, my, my favorite, um, this is something that I stumbled upon in my research for my Mellon lectures, having to do with the moiré effect in printmaking or interference effects in printmaking. Early modern engravers cultivated the moiré effect to produce higher order optical vibrations in images that sort of escaped the symbolic confines of the image. So when you have, uh, I'm looking particularly at the clouds up at the top of this print, uh, the moiré effect is adding a certain energy to that image. It's, give, it's putting something there that, that isn't part of the image itself necessarily. Um, Jan Müller in his Orion on a Dolphin, engraved around 1600, is uniquely able to perform the subject matter he depicts. In the ancient Greek fable, the beauty of Orion's music inspires the gods to send dolphins to rescue him at sea. At sea. The moiré patterns in the clouds over his head that Müller puts there generate a direct visual analog for the resonance of this miraculous sound. So in essence, the engraving, by being an engraving, and you can't do this in painting, the engraving plays the story in a way that the source painting could not. It makes something happen on that flat plane that exceeds its initial boundaries. We might say that it becomes optically superconductive. Likewise, contemporary physicists are actually now cultivating the moiré effect, something that again um, was first developed in printmaking in a literal way. Just recently it was discovered that if thin sheets of graphene are rotated at what's called a magic angle, the moiré effects from the interference of their atomic structures will make the material superconductive. Electrons will be able to flow through the structure without resistance. And a whole subfield of what is called twistronics is emerging from this realization. But this is a point at which we have to, we have to really think about how what we would imagine to be merely pictorial effects in early modern print are being literalized in a really startling way. Moir the moiré effect is now creating superconductivity and at, like every physics lab it is jumping on this train right now. If you just look this up, <laughs> I swear, just Google it. You'll just see, just Google twistronics. Um, so, so print is still very much working uh, in contemporary printed technologies. All right, so these are just a few of the ways that we might create the conditions for a history of conductive printmaking. I realize that I should have replaced the apocalypse with an apotheosis there, but just imagine that instead. Um, the goal of such an endeavor, to my mind, would be to make it possible for scholars of historical print to recognize themselves in this circuit board, to feel that we belong to it, and that I suppose it belongs to us in a certain way. But even more urgently, it would be to make it possible for engineers and scientists of all kinds to recognize themselves in an early modern print, in say a Dura print. As museum and educational professionals, we need to make students in the STEM fields feel that they belong in print rooms. This is an absolutely crucial, if underemphasized aspect of any museum initiative in inclusion and belonging. For my own part, I'm becoming increasingly strident about the idea that if the humanities are to thrive in the future, they must do a better job of cultivating affinities with the sciences, engineering, and medical fields. This will require developing what we might call a non-binary image of the relationship between the arts and the sciences. Within art history, the history of print is actually one of the most promising areas for making this happen, precisely because printmaking is itself unquestionably a technical field as well as an art field. Printmaking is always adjacent to technology. It's inseparable from it. That makes some people very uncomfortable, but I'm saying we just need to lean into that, as it were. This means not only that we can teach engineers about printmaking in a language they can relate to, but that we can also learn from engineers about hidden and latent capacities of the works we look at every day. We can show STEM students what it might look like and feel like to be invested in this technology in a different way and they can do the same for us. 
but it does require that we open ourselves to thinking differently about what print is and what it does. It requires that we open ourselves to a more circuitous history of print. Print does not sit outside the world merely contemplating it or illustrating it, but rather controls and shapes it, engineers it. It has always done this. Print is not dead and neither is historical print scholarship because one thing is for sure, we are all still running on print. Thank you. So I'm very happy to take questions and especially just discussion. Um, like I said, this is incredibly speculative. I am by no means an electrical engineer and I'm not even really an early modernist. All I'm doing is trying to broker an opening between uh, two fields. So happy to take questions. Please do not ask me about quantum computing. <laughs> I will not be able to answer you. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for that wonderfully generative talk. And our first question is Walter. Walter. Yeah, that was so brilliant. <laughs> so so I was, um, I've been reading recently um, the work of media historians who talk about the very important shift from the World Wide Web as a platform that would disseminate um, the capacity to code to a different kind of platform. Um, in which uh, information is shared, but no one knows how to code anymore except very specialized coders. Uh -huh. And, and, and um, there is a, a kind now of uh, rupture between any understanding of how a computer operates and our use mm -hmm. of computers. And so that leads me to ask if when a circuit board becomes incredibly complex, so complex that it can no longer be cognized by the human mind, mm -hmm or miniaturized so that it becomes indiscernible yep. to human sense. Does the connection between this kind of print technology mm -hmm. and the notion of printing that you have explained to us here, mm -hmm. uh, circuit printing, mm -hmm. does that connection still obtain or is that connection broken? And so that would yeah. be my first question. My second question is, a simpler one, it's a purely historical one. Did Eisler construe the kind of pattern making he was endorsing as abstraction? Oh, hmm. that's a very interesting question. Um, just to answer that second question, I don't, I mean, no, in, in what I've read, there was no, um, he's not saying, oh, this is like abstract painting. Um, I don't think he's seeing it, he, I don't think he's seeing it as abstraction in the sense that you would think about abstraction in the art world. Um, but I do think, and he does use the word ornament here and there, so he is understanding these patterns as, uh, I don't know how to put it, maybe an intelligent, uh, intelligent ornament might be one way of, of putting it, but that he, he, does, he, does, he does see the connection um, between sort of ornamental structures and careful, the, the kind of, especially the kind of careful spacing that's required in a circuit design. I mean, if you think about the process of copper plate engraving, it also it matters a great deal how far apart your lines are in a crosshatch, for example, because that will affect how quickly the copper weighs, wears down and the way it holds ink and so forth. So, he's, so he is thinking about, um, He's thinking about the laying down of lines in an abstract way, but he's not thinking about it as abstract art, I guess I would say. But that's a great question, something that I might want to look back at. Um, yeah, so the, so the whole question of miniaturization and microprocessing, uh, that is a great question. I mean, one of the things that's so fascinating to me is that um, you know, microprocessors, the stuff that's getting really, really small, as far as I know, it's, it's still printed, as, at least as of a couple years ago. It's still being printed. It's like a it's a it's a lithographic technique that uses ultraviolet light because ultraviolet light has the shortest possible wavelength and can be and can create the most fine the finest possible photolithographic trace. Um, so it's still being printed. Um, so in that sense, it's still part of the history of print. But yes, the whole question of whether the human mind can um, perceive or be cognizant of it. Um, I think there is a threshold there, but I actually think that threshold is sort of further away than we imagine it to be. Um, the, there have always been, 
uh, discussions in the history of print about, and this is something that Ivan says, for example, that certain kinds of syntax become so small that they retreat below the threshold of the human eye and are no longer part of your conscious understanding of the image. So like screen printing, for example, um, the screen matrix becomes too small really to, to, in, to intrude upon your perception. And you know, the halftone, for example, is famously discussed as something that's too small to see. Um, my, you know, my view is that when something becomes too small to be perceived with your normal everyday human eye, that's actually exactly when you need to start looking a little harder <laughs> and really try to, try to bring it within your purview one way or another and think it through. And so I think one of the things that I would like, I would like this paper to do or inspire in some way um, is, I mean, what, what's the advantage of having art history students looking, say, at a circuit board? One of the things that it does is that it brings it under the purview, it brings it under the view of a collection of thinkers and maybe critics and people who can begin to consider this something that is worth looking and thinking about. Um, and I think you can get pretty deep into circuits before they really become completely uncognizable. Um, and there's always microscopes, right? There's also, there's always scanning electron microscopes. So at least on the visual material level, it's still there. But yes, of course, it is retreating. I mean, and of course, the whole question of AI um, comes in here in an interesting way. And one of, the, one of the big, one of the fundamental problems with AI is that we actually don't know how these algorithms are working. You know, we, we design the algorithms, but they're doing things that we aren't controlling and we can't even perceive. So it is a very big question. But, but the, the history of print is a great place to ask these questions and to pursue them. And I think maybe that's something, another big lesson to take away here is that if we want to think about AI, if we want to think about the relationship between humans and machines, between different kinds of processing and coding um, and perceptibility and cognition, print is an excellent place to work some of these questions out and to have students think about them. Just precisely that question is so important and print is a great place to ask it. Jennifer, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. That was an incredibly stimulating lecture. It's Alex. Hello. Oh, hi, Alex. Yeah, um, got it. And, and as, as you were talking, I, I couldn't help thinking about one of the questions that Gombrich poses in the sense of order mm -hmm. um, over whether the visual appeal of certain non-art images is uh, accidental and mm -hmm. a condition of, of function and, and certain constraints that arise from function. And, and so following on from that, I, I wanted to pose a question of your material, of your printed circuits that some art historians have asked of informational or epistemic mm -hmm. images, which is whether any of the visual choices that are made are made not with function in mind, but with aesthetics mm -hmm. in mind. And I don't think that's a binary question, to go back to your very important point about bringing together um, yeah. the humanities and STEM, right. because it's something that, that we find in mathematics, most obviously, uh, that there can be a range of options when it comes to the solution of a mathematical problem, and a mathematician may well choose the proof that is m most elegant. That's, that's the word that mathematicians yeah. most often yeah. use. So, so my question is, is whether this can ever be the case for printed circuits. Um, is the visual appeal of printed circuits ever determined by something other than function? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if so, how would we understand and grapple with aesthetic choice in a printed circuit? Right. That's such a great question, and I, I can't, uh, I can't answer the, I can't answer you at least in, in as much as um, I'm not. I haven't been able to talk to lots of circuit. I mean, the, the way to answer that is actually to sit down with a bunch of circuit designers and ask them about how they lay these out and what are they thinking as they're doing it. Um, you know, and, and you can read a lot of technical manuals, but they are all, they all talk about the functionality of it. It's amazing because it's, it's incredibly elaborate and they, they, these feel to me as I read through it like decisions that have very pronounced aesthetic outcomes but they're, fun they're functionally driven. Um, and and you know, certain things like um, 
the the different length like the different lengths of traces have to be laid out in different places on the on the circuit so the short ones are in the middle and the longer ones go along on the outside and that produces a kind of aesthetic effect um, but I guess one way I would answer that is just to say that when we're talking about um, a pattern that is being read by electrons or by electricity um, how do we talk about the preference for ele of electrons as they're moving through that space? Um, isn't it a kind of a, an aesthetic of electricity? And so I wonder about whether the whole distinction between functionality and aesthetics holds in this kind of a pattern. Um, I don't have the answer to that, but we're looking at, this is a sort of meeting of species or meeting of readers or meeting of, look, of lookers that have different demands from an image and would have a different kind of um, sort of judgment on it, right? So um, there, it's very much functional. I mean, you can't, if you, if you design a circuit board that is, has a break in it or doesn't follow the functional rules, you're you know, your laptop will start on fire or, you know, it won't work. And there's a lot, there's a, there's a ton of prototyping and testing that goes on and circuit boards are constantly failing because of layout problems. So of course it is primarily functional, but then, um, there's a sense in which this, what the electrons need might also be what the human eye needs in certain cases, um, especially in terms of spacing. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Oh, sorry. I went too oh. long, didn't I? <laughs> um, first, firstly, just to follow up on the, the, the last question, there's um, a phrase called circuit melting, and um, it responds to delinearizing the path the circuit mm -hmm. takes, and now mm -hmm. those often aren't, you know, that's now a sub um, sort of process that we let computers make the traces once the like mm -hmm. um, parameters are set mm -hmm. and the angles that are chosen are, are programmed into it. So there's absolutely an aesthetic, you know, function to it. And when they were all done analog, they have a different look, like, you know, uh -huh. cut by hand versus now. Oh, um, it's so easy to make them all look so straight that we just sort of, um, it's, I think, definitely is an aesthetic preference towards those things. but. Um, Beyond that, my question that I had was towards, to what degree do you think that um, when we look back on the work of you know, printmakers throughout history and artists throughout history as well, um, are we historicizing their role in a way that we are you know, using a contemporary lens of the role of the artist where I think to some degree where the largest connection lies is between the need to communicate information and an information theory that underlies both the mechanical principles going on in a circuit and the, you know, the goal of someone who's making an image that serves a purpose. Um, and I think that now we use this sort of um, romantic sense of what art is and what artists do mm -hmm in a way that, um, you know, removes some of that deep history of um, human knowledge and progress and research that sort of went into their work. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, um, I think what you're asking, asking is how do we, you know, one of the things you're asking is how do we, how do we take an art history model of authorship and, and impose it upon engineering and um, I think that's another reason that printmaking is such a, and print and printmaking is such a great place to think through the connection between these, these kinds of fields because of course um, printmaking is also a practice that is very much about kind of distributed cognition and distributed intelligence and collaboration and you know, it's only in a very tiny sliver of the history of print that you have something like the artist, the romantic artist, right? Uh, and so thinking through, bringing print in, into conjunction with this engineering history, 
um, I think also helps us as print scholars think differently about the way we, we attribute um, aesthetics and authorship to prints. I mean, I've, I've, one of the things I'm deeply interested in, for example, is and we've talked about this a little bit um, earlier this week, is you know, where, where are the printers in the history of fine printmaking? Where are the people who are wiping the plates? Where are the people that are cleaning up the room? Where, you know, where we, we are, we're starting to trace some like material paths into and out of the print studio, but um, all of the collective labor that goes into print studios is still, I think, basically under theorized. Um, and even when you go to sort of fine art print studios, um, you often find even like master printers who are uncomfortable talking about themselves as as authors, um, they they just gesture to the artist and say, the, 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 "I just do what the artist says." So, so there is, I think, a real need to kind of recognize um, these other modes of of threading an image through multiple different intelligences, intelligences, different beings between humans and machines, between humans and materials, and print is just a fantastic place to look at that. Um, and print is also. Print and engineering are both spaces that are all about um, a, hi a history built from working knowledge of makers, um, more so than you know, the interpretive knowledge of art historians. And that's also what I love about this history is that you know, there aren't books about the aesthetic of circuit design. You've got to go read the technical manuals written by the people that designed them and talk to the people that designed them. And I love that about it. So. Thanks for that question. That is a beautiful note to end, though I'm sure we could ask you many more questions. Thank you again, Jennifer. Thank you, everyone, for being here.